My name is Devin and I am the marketing manager with Center for Book Arts. And for nearly 50 years, the center has been committed to promoting active and accessible explorations of the book as an art object. And today we serve as an international hub for research, practice, education, collaboration, and exhibitions, showcasing the multitude of forms and processes the book can take with an emphasis on cultural equity, expansive dialogue, and economic access for all makers. We are so thrilled to launch the pilot of Book Arts Toward Liberation. This has been kind of a long time coming and it's a lunchtime conversation series curated by the illustrious Gina Valentine and Heather Hart of Black Lunch Table. The series centers Black voices in the book arts, publishing field and beyond. And as an effort to expand the discourse of Black visual and literary artists, printmakers, book artists, and Black-owned presses, Gina and Heather will moderate a four-part series over the course of the fall 2020 season, harnessing space to discuss themes and topics within the intersections of Blackness, production, and creative placemaking. Special thanks to Stephen Berry, Deirdre Lawrence, David Solo, and everyone who's contributed through our Broadsides for Black Futures fundraiser for their generous support of the series. Heather Hart is an interdisciplinary artist exploring the power in thresholds, questioning dominant narratives, and creating alternatives to them through architectures and viewer activation. Gina Valentine's interdisciplinary practice is informed by the intuitive strategies of American folk artists and traditional craft techniques and interweaves histories latent with found texts, objects, narratives, and spaces. Gina and Heather are the founders of Black Lunch Table, whose primary aim is the production of discursive sites wherein artists and local community members engage in dialogue on a variety of critical issues. Gina and Heather, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you, Devin. Um, and thank you to Center of Book Arts in general. Um, so this summer, Gina and I were both watching Jill Scott and Erica Badu on Versus TV, dancing, finding a recipe and cooking, each in our respective cities. And we felt a soothing of our souls. We, wanted, we felt a broken from staying inside and in battling the news, but in battled by the news. But this moment was a salve. These are musicians who have been and remain seminal for us. They transport us, spark our soundtrack to memory. Seeing them empathize with us and with each other as we sheltered in place, they reached through digital space to create something together. And it felt like a moment we will log into our collective archive. They connected us through our phones, tablets, laptops, desktops, all over the world. And for one evening, they connected us. Folks in all of the places felt this love, mutual respect and community, despite all odds. Prompted by this series, we considered the outer limits of what constitutes a book, or specifically an artist book, artist plus book, artist equals book, and we determined that books contain language in many forms and invite a corporeal experience of media and speech acts. We considered the book as it is constitutive of the archive and as it is representative of the body, to a body as knowledge or as an extension of body. From these considerations, we determined abstract themes for our four-part series, coded language, technical writing, the corpus or body as archive, multivocality, and self-authorship. These categories have guided our conversations around and planning for this series. For today's conversation, we chose a theme of coded language and private language. Language spoken, written, and acted is encoded, transmitted, intercepted, and interpreted. Its meaning is subject to and product of its animation. A secret, a password, an inscrutable scribble equals safeguarded content. Vernacular foreign endangered languages encrypted for an unintended correspondent. So clearly Stephanie Jemison and Jonathan Gonzalez are the best choice for this conversation. Stephanie is an interdisciplinary artist based in Brooklyn, New York. Her recent work approaches privacy and opacity 
as strategies of abstraction and political resistance. Recent solo exhibitions and commission performances have been featured, have been featured at the Steadwood Museum, the Whitney Biennial, Jeux de Pong, CAPC Bordeaux, Mass Mocha, Nottingham Contemporary, the RISD Museum, and the Museum of Modern Art. Jemison holds an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and a BA in Comparative Literature from Columbia University. And Jonathan Gonzalez is an artist working at the intersections of performance, text, sculpture, and other time-based media. And he's been there from Queens, New York. Uh, Gonzalez's work speculates on the political utility of the stage as a method to interface with publics upon systems of liveness, objects, and economies of data um, that construct the built environment. Recent projects have been featured at Yale Union, Paragon Arts Gallery, Columbia School of Architecture, the MoMA PS1, the Abrams Art Center. Jonathan's work has received recognition and support from the LMCC, the Jerome Foundation, Art Matters, and the Foundation for Contemporary Arts, among others. We basically wanted to take a moment to thank these two, but really just wanted to hand it over to them. So welcome and thank you, Stephanie and Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that introduction. It's great to be here. Thank you. And hi, everybody in the um, virtual audience. There's so many people, so many familiar faces and friends here. I wish that you could have your video on because I would love to see you. And I'm just going to imagine that all of your smiling faces and um, clapping hands are out there chatting with me. But please please put uh, questions into the chat because I would love to hear actually any thoughts that arise. So where should we start, Jonathan? <laughs> to be honest, I think that I wanted to start where we left off on the phone, which okay. might sidetrack us from introducing ourselves. So if, we ha if you feel like we should tangentially get back to introducing ourselves, please do. But we ended somewhere that was about collaboration and I don't want to go there yet but we we what came to mind when you spoke about intimacy and intimacy in both of our work I thought about also um, what you said about opaqueness with both the introduction we heard and also maybe how uh, a guest might experience the work it made me think about the word disruption and um, which I think can be I, I experience sometimes as being reductive like you know can also um, take on certain kinds of attributes of antagonism that I don't always ask for my work to be, but is interpreted as. But I'm thinking about what it means to actually compose disruption, like, and if you can locate that in what you do with the people that you do it with. Sure, um, that's such a good question. And um, so, yeah, it's so great to start this conversation right in the middle of things where we left off on the phone <laughs> 20 minutes ago. Um, we, uh, Jonathan and I, um, it's really great to be in conversation because we um, uh, are, I think, mutual, mutual, part of a mutual admiration society. We really love each other's work, um, but we haven't spent so much time talking and we have a lot to talk about. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, um, I think you're frozen, Steph. We were discussing earlier. Can you hear me now? Yeah, you're back. OK. Um, one of the, and if this happens again, then I can try um, moving to a, a different place with maybe better internet. Um, so um, Jonathan and I were talking about the word opacity as it is used to um, describe individual artist practices. Um, and we were thinking both about um, the ways in which the work um, sort of makes itself available or accessible to an audience, and also thinking about um, the, the material that the work thematized. Um, so, and in this conversation, we um, discussed, we, we discussed and have 
considered such a wide range of things, um, include um, everything from um, what it means as an artist who organizes to, um, to be sort of placed into the role of mediator or translator, um, all the way from that to um, the ways in which we ourselves as individual artists, um, each of us has a, um, have, um, practices that are, that are kind of solo individual um, art practices, movement practice, performance practice, um, how it is that we think about um, our own, how it is that we think about um, uh, the kind of desk work, um, who is the work for, um, who, is the, who is the participant, uh, and how do we, um, um, how do we, how do, how do, how do we let people in? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a great synopsis. That was really generous. And so one of the, so, um, so we, we were talking about a few things. Um, and I'll say that um, for me, by way of introduction, I think maybe um, there many of you, um, you know, if you're here, maybe you've had some opportunity to um, read a little bit about what uh, Jonathan and I do, or you've had a chance to uh, see our work in person. Um, I myself make videos. Uh, I also make drawings, um, sound works, uh, uh, performance and movement-based work. I, I, I work in uh, many different media and I see all of that work uh, really in conversation with each other. I also see my own um, practice as a site where conversation, sort of deep, intimate conversation uh, between people, um, bet um, bet uh, between artists um, and between historical moments can unfold. And, um, and I think about that conversation, obviously not necessarily literally, not just in terms of um, actual talking, um, but also um, thinking about all of the forms of all of the sites of contact, all of the kinds of encounter. Um, and one of the things that uh, really interests me in your work, Jonathan, is the way you sometimes use the word collision to describe um, the forms of relation that are possible between artists and artists, between artists and witness, between artists and audience, um, and the ways that a word like collision might open up um, different possibilities for thinking about um, thinking about who the work is for and how it can be understood. Because ultimately, questions for me around um, encoding, privacy, opacity, uh, secret. All of those, um, all of those questions for me return to a kind of larger um, uh, set of interests that I think both of us share um, that um, um, are both interests and sometimes problems that mm -hmm. have to do with um, with um, understanding, with the nature of understanding, what it means to understand, um, the way that understanding helps organize our desire, um, what it means to want to understand other people, um, what it means to um, to impede or complicate or um, you, um, you know, organize um, uh, a, a witness or a viewer's access to understanding um, and how that can actually be the subject of a work itself. Yeah, yeah. I, I would jump in to give myself a sense of introduction and add on to that and maybe throw something else into the pot. Um, I, yeah, so my, I guess my trajectory into practice comes from both um, arriving as a musician, training in, in, as a vocalist, actually, and an instrumentalist, and then going into performance, into dance, really, and like finding a kind of physical practice of making material objects and things simultaneously while thinking a lot about what choreography means. And that feels um, important to name because the process of both being in the musical setting, which was really singing in groups, singing in choirs, and you know, um, playing in orchestral settings, playing with people, moved into a kind of physical studio-based practice where there was still always somehow collaboration involved inside of that. Um, and I guess what, um, going back to some of the things you're saying, Steph, and, and going back to this um, circumstance of dis disruption, maybe to talk about at the beginning, um, I, had, I had a pretty significant period of time where I was a performer, which was, I think, I really foundational to understanding also like the the uh, what we'll get to like the pluralities of being with someone's authorship, being in dialogue as a collaborator, experiencing directorship, understanding different structures of the way that creative um, synergy happens inside of the room where the work is happening, and how an ecology of being together is so necessary. One to like make a thing if you desire for that to be the practice of making it with people versus an individual. Um, and also what happens when you do it and you deal with the kinds of ways that um, it becomes um, 
commodified or produced or legible to or enters into market. And, and it also makes me think of um, just like the very common catchphrase that, you know, being black is something you do with others. It's like then like what happens when you start to work with the kinds of um, the multivalent non-monolithic space of what it means to be in kind of an ephemeral sense black or dealing with the kind of life affirming possibilities of figuring in black life into spaces like the physical, the sculptural, the cinematic, the live. Um, and when you get there, at least for myself as a performer that then was able to step into kind of the multivalent ways I could also see um, other aspects of my engagement and practice, I recognize um, very quickly the circumstances of the stage by way of getting more embedded inside a black study and really being embedded in community, right? Like the community aspect of being with other artists inside of such a seminal time period that I was coming into being able and privileged to perform is also a process of coming into thinking about all of the, the bedrock of you know, a libidinal economy, what happens when you are consumed in a space and how to deal with um, both the term opacity, but how to also deal with the situation of rest and the situation of um, retreat um, and preservation um, because you're doing it with people. So you also are tracking like as a kind of contingent, what do we need, you know, before the audience? What do we need first, you know? Right. Uh, yeah. Can I ask a very autobiographical, practical question for you? Please. So, um, I know that now you're you you um, you work in many different modes, but are often um, but one of the sort of primary sites where your work has been supported and where we've encountered it um, has been through um, what's called what's called like performance, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder, and I know, and you just now mentioned that you have a background in um, uh, music, and that you and that you've sort of seen yourself as a performer. And I also know from from our, you know our past conversations that you find the mode of the presentational complicated, like mm -hmm. that you have a complicated relationship to the stage, and yet you find something really precious about it. And I wonder if you can talk more about um, how that happened. <laughs> um, yeah. how I guess the reason that I that I that I'm interested in talking about that is that it helps me also. I, I think that if we can um, tease out something about like the uh, complications of what it means to present or what it means to be presentational as a body while also refusing access, that that might help us get somewhere in terms of understanding what we can do, um, what we can do with uh, our secrets, like what um, the the kind of uses of. Um, uh, opacity as it's in, as it's employed sort of strategically mm -hmm. that's great that really hits to the, that getting to thorny um yeah i be, i be, if i could be autobiographical and say like you know i was in public school in new york city in queens and we had an amazing music teacher whose name was miss d and she would she would just spend hours with you after class and before class just sitting at the piano and teaching you songs you know and that sits really um, distinct in my memory as a time in which being in the auditorium space where the stage was located was a way for me to also feel like school was a place that I had a sphere of my own where I recognized that I was, you know, being in a classroom setting was was necessary, but being in the auditorium made it possible to show up to the classroom. And um, and in that space. It's so interesting that being yeah. in the auditorium makes it possible to show up in the classroom. We have to come back to that. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it ended up, you know, doing what it does, which is it, it creates a kind of culture of asking what can, you know, what can we do each year, you know, becoming a, a becoming kind of interested all the time and being on the stage, um, which was always actually with people, you know, making, making short excerpts, making scenes, writing things you know, being very playful and improvisational with the space of um, of undoing a lot of the kinds of things that were being socialized upon us as young people inside of an inner city, trying to understand how we were being complicated by gender and race and class. So, you know, like that space was very fertile as a way to be in retreat, actually. And, and in a lot of ways, the kinds of professionalisms of that um, in some ways kind of destroyed that, you know, to be honest, you know, it destroyed yeah. the naivety, it destroyed the space of innocence that is so possible, which I really value and am reminded more and more during COVID where there's like a kind of accumulation pause, like, oh yeah, all of that really fertile 
space of like undoing that happens in those brief moments. Like that is what is really important to me, you know? And um, then when the stage gets more real, when the stage becomes touring, when the stage becomes audiences, when it becomes negotiations of language and press and the industry machine, um, that's when I start to think about what you're saying, presentation, which also comes from a very deep interior place. Like there's a, a high theoretical landscape around like, why the stage, not the stage, why the theater, not the theater. And then there's a gut part of me that's just like, to feel the stage as being at all um, sacrosanct is wrapped up with the fact that it is, you know, very similar. And this is kind of harsh, but I think it's important, like very similar to the locations of the plantation in a lot of ways. So, you know, like, um, and, I, and, I've, and I value the work of Josephine Baker and I value the situation of Nina Simone and I value the history of people who made the stage possible. And I believe in its ephemerality and also recognize its vehicle. And somehow inside of that, it's a mechanism I know how to communicate inside of too, you know? Yeah, um, yeah and thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Because I, you know, I think um, also what you're, um, so uh, one of the things that's so amazing about your work is that you really um, virtuosically um, begin, like take as a point of departure, a set of conventions around uh, the physical space and the social space of the stage, the, um, the um, sort of expected um, roles and characters and, um, tools that we all know and roles that we all play as, um, as, as performers, as audience, and you subvert them or you complicate them. So it's, it's through, um, it's, it's because you take, because we begin with a set of, um, you know, a set of uh, resources um, to which we all have access. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's only because of that, be, be, because of beginning with something that we know that you're able to kind of decompose it into something that we don't know. Um, and or that you're able to um, decompose it in, in a way that might be um, confusing or complicated or unexpected. Um, often by tying, um, like suturing elements of stagecraft that are not um, usually expected to connect by suturing them together so that light, for example, is tied to the volume of your voice. Well, those two mm -hmm. things are not are not expected to, to relate to one another. Mm -hmm. um, but in your work, in, um, in your work, they do. And so um, it's through, it's by um, sort of upending those expectations that you um, draw our attention to the, a, a kind of shared vocabulary of presentation or a shared vocabulary of the theater while also um, um, pointing to the ways in which that vocabulary can be mm -hmm. uh, reorganized or um, um, exploded. Mm -hmm. what, well, I would put that back on you in some ways too and wonder about what your thoughts are you know, when I'm thinking about um, the work that I saw at the Whitney, which is the most recent one that I saw in terms of live work, um, and thinking about maybe it's a maybe it's a poor question, so I'll invite you to kind of like go far with it. But thinking about time, you know, thinking about the attributes of time and how I feel like in so much of your work, whether it's performative or not, the the for me the proposal to sit with in a way that also um, is demanding, not just leisure, which we talked about on the phone, but demanding also like a space of, um, which I think is a very resistant step too, of, 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 being, of being undone from a kind of singular belief, you know, to be, to be left with a kind of punctuation, not a period, which um, makes, it, makes it difficult, you know, and is also important because it is difficult to me. So I wonder about time and what you would say about that. That's, a, that's such an interesting question. Um, so, many, so many ways of thinking about that. On the one hand, um, of course, as you know, as, as for me as an artist, I do think of time as one of the key tools that I have. Like it's one of, um, it's one of the most important resources that I have and it's tied to this other really important resource, uh, which is attention. And, um, you know, I, I, I mentioned earlier um, when, we, when we were talking that um, I think both you and I are often super um, frustrated by 
um, have a kind of complicated relationship to our roles as um, organizers, as educators, as um, institutional affiliates and representatives. Um, we are working simultaneously within and outside institutions. We're also creating our own institutions. Um, and we're always thinking about the infrastructure through which our work is supported. Uh, and the work of others is supported um, at the same time as we are making ourselves. Um, and so I was and one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that one of, you know, um, uh, the, the space of um, like contemporary art or the space of contemporary performance, it's so it's it's like it's almost like, you know, I don't know, toss the whole thing out like it's so problematic. <laughs> and we both know this. And, um, <laughs> and then, but and then, but then one of um, the, but there are a few things that um, are kind of that are kind of irreplaceable and really precious that those spaces make possible, and um, and one has to do with the kind of with with the kind of attention that is um, expected or that's created um, or that's held by you know art as a space, art institutions as as spaces, um, galleries as social spaces. Um, performance as a kind of shared set of expectations. Um, and that mode of attention is, 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 is always, um, for me, it's always, it's inseparable from, um, I can't think about it without also thinking about time um, and the way in which our um, experience of anything, any object, any, um, you know, any image, any, all encounters are, you know, of course are, are embedded in time. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the, you know, it's often in my work, I, I play with um, an experiment with um, kind of, uh, I don't know, shifting, changing, um, reorganizing the, you know, the, the, the experience of time, um, um, producing maybe a, an experience of time in the work or for the audience um, or for the witness or for the viewer that might be different from real time or might be different from their expectations um, in order to um, to sort of um, like stretch out um, like taffy kind of stretch out uh, an experience in order for us to sort of examine and um, and and consider all of its possibilities mm -hmm. often I, I think for me I the the work wherever it is located is mostly unfolding in the you know hearts and minds of the people who experience it it's, it seems trite but is um, but that's really important and so um, and so for me, part of it is like how how to create the space for those experience those meaningful experiences to unfold um how to um how to uh invite how to make an invitation um to um to um, a, a, a witness a viewer and an audience member to um to reflect on mm -hmm. the experience that they're having at that moment mm -hmm. um and i think and i think this is something that um that your work um, that you have also explored in in your work, um, ex um, sort of thinking about um, the um, what it means to not occupy time in ways in ways that are um, that time is maybe typically occupied by vernacular media or by um, I don't know social media or in the era of the internet, um, but instead um, to create space for uh, a, a witness to reflect on their own experience of time mm. it makes me think about and that was thank you that was really generous and very helpful like it, it, it makes me think about um something i was saying this weekend um to to uh, my partner actually that i was thinking about you know um i was thinking about the con the conditions which it's it, you know it's sometimes it's a taboo term and but of, of like what is what is sacred you know what is still sacred to the work of making something or what is sacred to moving beyond the term work and getting to the fact that it's a necessity um which is not so much a question but maybe just like a provocation to put into the space of you know um because there's sometimes like in these in these dialogues we can get into kind of like um very large thematic ideas and i wonder what becomes the root um energetic space. When you're talking about the occupation of time, I can't not think about the occupation of territory. So I think about sacredness as like what happens inside of the language, or at least for me, a very big driver 
is thinking about the ecology of all the objects and beings that are associated in the room when things happen, whether it's a physical manifestation that will exist on a wall that someone will come at some point and witness or a live setting where people are together. And that is a kind of dynamism that can only live on that cellular level then. And you know that, that kind of assemblage and to hold space for that feels again, like the kind of deviance of being in collaboration, like to demand that actually which in in a lot of ways is, is is about getting to a root language around what is blackness or getting to a root language about what is indigeneity as it pertains to blackness too like you know what does it mean to to which is the which is deviant to the to the contemporary art engine to actually have an intent that's embedded inside of like an audrey lord a kind of a space of the erotic that cannot be touched um, or commodified that makes it necessary against all odds to still want to be involved in the process of producing these things um, and to be with other things when making it and thinking about how it becomes, which um, is antithetical to the ways that we're asked a lot of time to be, you know, Stephanie as the individual and Jonathan as the individual, you know, when we know actually, at least for myself, <laughs> I don't I hope this is not therapy, but I feel like, um, <laughs> The inside outside, which is such a necessary situation, which you know some will say and some will not say, but we're navigating you and I is also about wrestling with the fact that when we know we step inside, we never step inside alone, but we're asked to present ourselves in that way, you know, in certain search. So we have to speak within the punctuation to identify how to let other people slip into the room with us when we're the only one allowed in. And that exists both in when I feel you or speak with you and what I appreciate about your presence, I feel it in your words and I see it in, in what is manifesting in the creative ecosystem of your ecology and both in like Louis, Louis place, you know, like both in just the very real platforms that you permit people to come together and to take risks in the most basic sense. Let's come together and spend time, you know? Um, well, Thank you, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah, one of the, I mean, it's true, it's true that, um, it's true that I do try to create spaces for people to spend time together. I see that there are um, a bunch of my um, recent students in the, in this, in this virtual space with us here. Um, one of the classes I teach is called Possibilities, and all, all we do is like just spend, um, um, pretty open-ended time together. It's like, how can we experiment with each other for the period of the class? Um, and I do, I do think a lot about how to, um, how to create that space for us as artists. Um, I certainly imagine, um, I am sort of always aware of the ways in which this, the very category of the artist is um, impossible. And we're, I'm always kind of imagining a, the, you know, space of its abolition, the world in which we are all equally making and um, learning and um, uh, listening and have access to this, to the, um, to what are often considered privileges associated with the kind of figure of the artist. Um, uh, um, while also, um, well, yeah, I'll, maybe I'll just kind of leave that there and say that that's really, that's really important. So for me, I'm always on the one hand thinking about the ways in which I can work with and alongside and around institutions. Um, and on the other hand, imagining, you know, of course you have to have one eye on the prize, which is so far beyond the horizon of any institution that we can currently conceive. Um, and, um, and never forgetting that and always kind of reminding myself of that, particularly, um, particularly in relation to um, the university, but not exclusively in relation to the university. Um, I think because, you know, that um, conversations sometimes are so specific to um, problems with higher education in particular, for example, but actually we also have to imagine the, you know, the space beyond the museum as we currently understand it. Um, and one of the things I think is um, really powerful that Black Lunch Table is doing is um, that they are um, in creating this um, kind of um, sort of rhizomatic um, network <laughs> of um, um, people who are all thinking about um, the, gosh, we've gotten so far removed from privacy and opacity and language, but we'll it's come back. It's happening on its own. It's happening on its own so. We'll circle back, okay. okay. Um, but one of the great things about um, what Black Lunch Table does is that um, they're um, really attuned to and thinking about the ways in which um, 
um, and uh, reimagining the possibilities for archival practices outside of outside of the space of the museum, outside of the space of the you know the library, outside of the legacy um, of the um, colonial archive, and um, that feels really important, urgent, like urgent, urgent work, and it's something um, it's something that I that I um, personally think about all the time. Um, for me. Um, and I think this um, intersects with ideas that that you and I have been um, have been already talking about. Um, but the, the the kind of challenge is um, how do we how do we continue um, to do the work while also kind of hiding in plain sight, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, um, for 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 lack of a better uh, phrase. How do we um, how do we um, uh, um, make decisions about um, what we present and what we sneak and um, what we what we hide and what we um, what we do undercover and what we do um, uh, you know in the guise of doing something else and how to and how we um, how can we how do we um, like turn the resources of the institution mm -hmm. on on the institution you know like what are all the different possibilities for what we can do around and between and through um, I love the this phrase you use um, uh, you have to say it again, um, working in the punctuation, speaking. Yeah. Yeah. Working. yeah. And you're talking literally about like period, space, mm -hmm. like that punctuation. I love that. Yeah. I really love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it makes me think so much about just the visual representations that you make. Um, but I, I want to just, this, this point that you're saying is so important. It's, you know, um, hiding in plain sight. I, I feel like, and I'm only I'm only as old as I am, so I know that there were previous moments where there's been a um, very seminal revolutionary spirits that have aligned in, with so many different ways of being internationally at the same time like this. But I'm here now, and um, when I think about what is afforded to to my community, I guess in this moment, because it's a thing that I talk with people about. It's not something I do alone. Um, is an opportunity, you know, is very, and that term is, is difficult because it has a certain level of optimism, which can be always um, already past tense, but an opportunity to consider like the role of the artist as being um, a little bit more dissolved, you know, a little bit more like um, broken apart, a little bit more like the walls around it and the interior of this space start to flood in things that wouldn't permit it before. And, um, which is also the problematics and the romantic romanticization of the role of the organizer that we we're talking about earlier that it's like you know it's not so much it's not so much that we all need to imitate the situation of being the lead organizer nor should we imitate the role of being the lead director and individual artist of a certain acclaim but it's like to do those things that we're talking about in the practice which is to imbue the day-to-day -day reality that makes example you know makes example you know like brings into like ways that there's um more multivalent you know um engagement and like there's more ways that what it means to be an artist is about also being everything else um which we already know like i know in my personal life like i know my my community are a, an assemblage of people who are making what they're making because they're making it because they want to and they're making out of duress and the situation of art is also life and it's not that deep and it's very deep and it's a you know and it seeks for public visage and, and it doesn't you know and all of those kinds of ways of being involved in being in a certain sense like anti anti uh, engine anti industry um have an opportunity now to like do the collision do the collision do the bleeding create some kind of network of thought and then, the, you know, then the pessimist in me says, well, I say that, that, and then there's a limited amount of actual opportunity in which will be afforded to do that work before the gates of all of the, all the gatekeeping formats, you know, except for Black Lunch Table, will, will begin to, you know, revert or uh, return or digest, you know, and arrive at a new version of, of cannibalization. And so staying inside of that space of like the griot, like trying to be, in the center of listening is also feels like a very important aspect to this moment, which can be very foundational and a system change process. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for invoking um, these um, um, really important points about um, also the the sort of the sort of temporary 
mm -hmm. um, nature of our contemporary understanding of what an artist is and mm -hmm. could be, um, both contemporary and like super culturally specific. And in fact, mm -hmm. there are other models and um, so much of um, the, the work that I, that I do as an artist has involved engaging with the, these sort of alternative genealogies, um, mm -hmm. just thinking of outside of this current, fig this contemporary figure of the artist altogether and, and um, um, imagining otherwise. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you want to do you want to speak to one of those examples for maybe both myself, which I would love to hear it in your in your words, and also for those of us who are here who don't know about one of your examples? Sure. Well, I can just I, I mean, I can mention a few since this is the center for book art. <laughs> maybe we can we should talk a little bit about writing. Um, and um, so I do have actually a little press um, called Future Plan and Program um, that publishes uh, uh, it's a kind of um, independently publishes books by artists of color. Um, we published a book by Gina Valentine, which is how I know her actually, through whom I know Heather. Um, so um, very important um, auspicious part of my, uh, my own um, sort of artistic genealogy. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Future Planet and Program, um, one of the, one of the uh, sort of works that I was making at the time that I created this, which, which was exactly 10 years ago, by the way, it was in um, 2010, um, was a, um, a, a work for which I um, invited two uh, spoken word poets. Um, they, their, their names that they used for their work were Truth and Greatness, um, Michael Graham and Corey Smith, Truth and Greatness, and they performed as a kind of performative duo. Um, and I, and I um, created a text-based work and later published as a book, um, a document of their um, sort of deep engagement with a set of um, questions that we had developed together. Um, more, you know, more recently I have worked, the work that I made in, um, that you experienced at the Whitney Biennial um, called Census Plenier um, was created um, in dialogue with, uh, a woman um, named Reverend Susan Webb, who is a um, master mime minister um, and who um, coordinates a um, uh, ministry of, um, of women, primarily women uh, in Harlem um, who are, are active in um, using pantomime as a, as a, as a tool for um, communicating the gospel. Um, those are two among, among so many different examples. I think a lot actually about um, about uh, like al um, alternative histories of publishing, self-publishing, um, and um, um, vernacular kind of um, poetry and verbal traditions that have not um, always been acknowledged as um, part of the um, mainstream sort of literary inheritance and how important those have been for us and how um, and um, how much work remains to be done to sort of excavate and understand and um, and live with um, this complex work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? <laughs> it does. My question. It does. It does. Yeah, I think Heather's Heather's going field questions in a little from y'all. So I, but maybe before we get there, it made me think of, um, yeah, it made me think of my relationship to writing, which I just, I, I guess I just wanted to think of, I've been thinking about it and thinking around it while looking at passages of things that have gone into publication or have been, existed just in my notepad and never it was seen the light of day. And I recognize also maybe with COVID and the slowdown, the kinds of ways I was thinking about Mark Fisher and, you know, Mark Fisher writes a lot about never having enough time to write, but being an academic who is very much so employed inside of visual culture and literature to always be producing something in order to arrive at tenure and never having the time to actually do the work more because of he's, he's talking about capital realism, accumulation, the commodification of all time, you know, like you just spoke about earlier, your email notifications being off, like all the things that get in the way you know, and I sometimes wonder about the joke of like, do I make performance because that's the, my response to the ways that um, the pace of life is? And would I write more books <laughs> if, if I lived on an isolated territory somewhere where I didn't have any technology? But that's just talking out loud. We got some questions. Yeah. Well, this is, I, I mean, as a transition to this first question, um, 
which I will read, um, but I don't want to forget what I was going to say, which has to do with the way that you use um, reading um, as a as a as an as an element of your own performance. Um, so the question is from Nina Schneider, and it says, "Thank you both for sharing your ideas with us." The first person I knew to incorporate performance into book arts is Susan Joy Share, who taught at the Center for Book Arts in the '90s. Can you comment on the performative aspects of reading? On the performative. I'm sorry, um, and how it may influence your experience with writing and publishing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. What were you going to say? You... I was just going to say that the the, um, the work that I was just describing, um, this you know, this collaboration with Truth and Greatness. So um, I invited them to 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 have this conversation and to write a new poem. That was essentially what I did. I commissioned a poem from them, and then I took this thick description, um, um, like all of this material that I had, and I, narr I turned it into like a single narrative. So it was like a, a novella, I published it as a novella. The mm -hmm. novella was a conversation between truth and greatness, writing a poem. And um, the, so the novella was presented as a series of photographs in a gallery. And the um, photographs had to be like, in order to experience the work initially, you actually had to go and stand there and read each page. Um, and I remember how incredibly frustrated people were that the only experience of the book, they were like, but what, but why, but can you just send it to me? Can, but how can I, um, and it's funny, but the experience of reading is so, I mean, um, it's, um, it's, it's super physical. Um, it's um, always embedded in time, even though there's a kind of um, fantasy or a like a, a the, the kind of fiction that we experience the book all at once or that we like the you know for criticism the idea that you can just like um write about the whole book because or talk about a whole book as though it was all one thing as though it was not something different every moment every hour every day um mm -hmm. that you encountered it mm -hmm. um so i um and this is one of the reasons actually why i'm so interested in um in um performative histories of poetry, performative histories of writing. Um, and of course, they're how they've been erased, but also um, how influential and important they've been. Mm -hmm, yeah. You use reading as a, as a tool in performance. Yeah, I think I enjoy the, I enjoy what kinds of, well, yeah, I love reading just as a, as a normal uh, attribute of my life. I've enjoyed reading and I enjoy like consuming books with people. I like reading aloud a lot. Um, and when I think about an example of the ways that I've used the text that I've written and made it specifically for a live setting, I think about um, Lucifer Landing, which was a series of, of works that were about Chadas and June Jordan's work with architectural design in New York addressing um, the housing inequities. And in the process of trying to compose something actually musical, I, had, I realized that there was a necessary libretto that needed to be written in order to think about the sound that was being designed by uh, friends, collaborators. And, um, and that process was five different movements in which I was trying to both deal with, yeah, a question of like, what is literary format as, as, as it applies to trying to um, be um, in song and also be embodied. And, and, you know, and there's like the basic ideas of the actor, like what kinds of um, phonics to avoid in order to really be able to access your full body. And then there's other things that are like, you know, like what is a kind of literary passage that I'm trying to expose over time, over a 50 minute series of constantly using voice. Um, and then there's the other aspect, which I feel very much so, um, was the quest like how to be inside of a literary form and also be like you're saying mutable and, and fall out of idiom and fall into form and um what ended up developing was like a series of varied and uh different languages which i think was like um quite natural because it was language coming from action you know so being physical in the studio finding voice in response to listening to sound and dealing with both very english or other languages and then also finding their kind of um, the way that they merged to produce something that was actually highly dynamic and from like a, a, a from a place of like fascia muscle and 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 letting that be text, um, which then ended up becoming projected and and spoken aloud, you know, in in the in the opera itself. And um, I appreciate that that space also the way that it can become somehow published and also fall outside of things at the same time. Yeah, I was reading earlier. Um, uh, I was trying to get to the bottom of whether the words actor and author are connected. Um, mm -hmm. I'm like super interested in um, the uh, relationship between these two different ways of 
thinking about where ideas come from in the body um, and um, ways of thinking about like origin. Um, so I'm really interested in how, like, um, um, I don't know, even as you were talking at the beginning earlier in this conversation about your, um, your sort of background in music and on stage, on the stage, um, I was thinking about the ways in which an actor is kind of like a medium, um, mm -hmm. like someone that's in between, um, and thinking about that in relation to um, some questions um, that both of us have considered around um, around authorship and mm -hmm. collaboration and mm -hmm. how the work unfolds between people. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, by the way, that those two words are really that related, um, but um, it offered, you know, food for thought. <laughs> Definitely food for thought. Yeah, I, I, I I think, does Evan have a question? It seems like, oh. Evan I think he wants to pose his question on camera. Oh, go for it, Evan. Um, hello. Uh, can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. um, so first, thank you so much for this. Um, but uh, I guess my question kind of has to do with the, because something that came up a lot was both of you thanking each other for the questions and this kind of just general idea of conversation, um, <clears throat> thinking about conversation in relation to what you both were talking about uh, with collaboration and collision and just how the conversation, um, this one and, and ones in general, whether it be with the, the Future Planet program or um, with, you know, conversations with the, the literature that you're pulling from or, you know, any of these things or the histories that you're pulling from and how that kind of operates as like the conversation operates as like a material to then influence what gets made. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah, I would agree. <laughs> is it a question? Is it, yeah, is that a question or a comment? I guess, like, I guess, like, more of like a, um, less in like a direct formulation of a question and more just like, um, I, I wonder how that kind of gets thought um, by the both of you, like if, if conversation is a word that comes up and if um, if that kind of idea of conversation is something that really uh, has like, you know, maybe it, it, you know, saying it out loud, it seems almost obvious that conversation would be an important part of the work, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. I would, I would, well, yeah, on different valences, it's like one. Wait, wait. Wait, Evan, come back. I have another, before you answer, just, okay. I'm sorry. Can you, the, you started that question by saying you two keep thanking each other. I know, that's what I was waiting for. Can, you, yeah. can you tell me more about what, I want to get at that part of the question. <laughs> that yeah. seems like the, the meaty and complicated part of your question. Yeah, well, I guess, yeah. And I think that's probably why I kind of pushed it away. But um, I guess when I, when, I, when I go to these kinds of talks and I hear these kinds of conversations, I pick up on certain things that start to like flow through it. Um, and I always enjoy, it doesn't happen often, but I enjoy when people thank each other for the questions. And, and there's this kind of like constant process of gratefulness, mm -hmm. this kind of constant process of like, um, uh, like almost like care that's embedded in thanking the other person consistently, even if it's an implicit to make it explicit mm -hmm. during the conversation. Um, and I guess like, uh, I guess maybe thank, thankfulness is like a different, a different way to make the conversation something different than maybe say like a conversation that is trying to always get something, always, you know, um, like the thankfulness maybe makes it less transactional or it makes, there's like an awareness around the conversation and, and all of the richness that's in it. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to answer that part first because it made me think about it made me think about one um, just honoring the time that I get to speak with Stephanie, which I think you know it's it's in that way it's a sincere like I appreciate doing the thing that we don't get to do often one because we're busy people in the world and also simultaneously because of all the considerations that don't put us in the same room today. So um, that's great. And that is, and I'm, and I feel a level of generosity to experience and to witness and to know that that is, if anything, a way for us to keep um, in collision. So I appreciate that. And I, and 
And that also feels attributed to what you were talking about earlier, Stephanie, and what we were talking about together earlier and what comes up and is around it, this word author and collaboration. And like the thing about conversation for me is that it shouldn't, it's not utopian, obviously, and it's complicated and it requires so many different levels of um, um, negotiations of potential of harm, you know, like in an abolitionist reality, if we talk about the situation of conversation, we bring in with us the power structures and dynamics that are embedded inside of being together. So it's like to say thank you and to mean it <laughs> is also to like make a demand onto the conversation be different. So, um, you know, that, that, that's a good question. Yeah. I think I think the only thing that I will add, um, thank you, thank you, Evan, and thank you also, Jonathan, for that answer. <laughs> um, the only thing that I will add is that sometimes um, there's a fiction with these kinds of um, dialogues that they um, are bracketing like a particular kind of like a, you know this this is supposed to be a talk about this you know, between these two people at these two times, at this specific time, you know, for this specific audience. But obviously it's never really like that. Um, first of all, because Jonathan and I, as we just said, just got off the phone 40 minutes ago, an hour ago. Um, and before that we were talking an hour and a half ago. And before that we were talking the day before yesterday. And so this is, um, you know, a moment within an ongoing conversation and all of you are invited to, to witness it, but it's not, um, it's, this is not this is not the beginning and end of the conversation, and it also is not some you know there there are some aspects of any any conversation any engagement that are you know that remain kind of private. Um, mm -hmm. At the as we first started talking, I was I was like, is it problematic that we keep saying as we just said as we just said as we were just talking about without really explaining that? And then I and then I was thinking, you know, actually it's actually it's fine. Actually, not only is it fine, but maybe there's something really important about leaving so much um, leaving so much unspoken um, about allowing the this moment to be understood as something that's you know always belated and also always anticipatory um, and is never everything and um, and um, that the um, that maybe it helps us to think a little bit about the um, both about both about what we've missed about the kind of preciousness of these of, of moments that have passed and about everything that is to come mm -hmm. Yes. Dovetailing on Evan's question and observation, we wanted to conclude here by thanking you both. Um, that was amazing. I feel like we could probably go on a lot longer with questions about um, unfolding conversations and punctuation, which we actually didn't get to. Um, <laughs> And I encourage everyone to, you know, keep an eye on both Jonathan and Stephanie's work. Um, it was a pleasure. I guess I also want to um, plug in the chat. The next conversation will be October 26th at 1 p.m. Um, and you can RSVP with the link there. We're going to be talking about technical writing in the most untechnical writing way with Nonsi Kalelo Mutiti and Mimi Onuoha. So I hope you guys can join us. And again, I look forward to hearing you guys talk again at some other point. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you everybody for coming. coming. Thank you. Thank you everyone. <laughs>